Greetings everyone. 28th February is celebrated as the National Science Day every year in India to mark the discovery of Raman effect by Indian scientist Sir C. V. Raman on 28th February 1928. In 1986, the National Council for Science and Technology Communication asked the Government of India to designate February 28th as National Science Day. This day is celebrated all over India in schools, colleges, universities and all academic institutions. Today, on the occasion of National Science Day 2022, students of Garden High School have come up with a couple of scientific experiments and demonstrations to encourage and spread the message of the importance of science. The motto is to popularize science and technology for a better living. Did you know that it was our very own Jagadish Chandra Bose who proved that plants have a definite life cycle, a reproductive system and are aware of the surroundings? As we all know, organic life needs a regular uptake of water. Animals, by virtue of their mobility, have an easier access to this life-sustaining resource. Plants compensate for this lack by specialized water uptake processes. The study of these processes falls under plant physiology, a subdiscipline of botany concerned with the functioning of plants. Today, we have for you a presentation of how absorption of water takes place in plants. We will take a closer look at how this process, a crucial part of every plant life, works. Hello everyone, I am Orhan Guamazundar of Class 6C, Garden High School. Today, I am going to show you the structure of stomata under a compound microscope. But what are stomata? Well, they are the minute microscopic pores usually present in more numbers on the lower surface of a dicot leaf. They may be present in more or less equal numbers on both the upper and lower surfaces of a monocot leaf. They help in gaseous exchange and transmission. We will use the following materials for an experiment. A biophylum leaf, a paint brush, a pair of forceps, a blade, iodine solution, a wash glass, water, a dropper, a cover sleeves, a slide and a compound microscope. First, I am going to take a clean biophylum leaf and peel it diagonally very carefully. A membranous epidermis layer is produced as you can see here. This is our sample. I have already taken a small part of this sample and put it on the slide and then I have put two to three drops of iodine solution on it with the help of my dropper. After that I have put a cover slip on it. I have first lowered one side of the cover slip and then put the other sides of it very carefully. This I have done very cautiously and delicately so that no air bubbles can enter the area enclosed by the cover slip. As I have done it already, this is the final product. Okay, now if I put this final product on the stage and uh, fasten the clips and see it through the eyepiece of the microscope, I can clearly see the stomata. Whatever I have seen through the microscope, I have taken a picture of it and it can be seen in the laptop. As you can see, the white structures are the stomata. Thank you! Hello everyone! I am Snehal Shakravarti from Class 7A and I am here today to introduce you to stomata, a small yet important part of plant physiology. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Stomata, singular stoma, are minute pores present in abundance at the lower epidermis of green leaves in dicot plants. They are also present in the stem. Stomata help in gaseous exchange in plants. They are also responsible for a phenomenon called transpiration. Transpiration is the process by which plants lose water from their bodies. The stomata are surrounded by two bean-shaped cells called guard cells which regulate its opening and closing. The inner walls of the guard cells are thicker than the outer walls. 
During the day, the roots absorb water due to greater transpiration pull and it is transported to different parts of the plant through the xylem. The guard cells on receiving this water swell and become turgid. As a result, they bulge outwards as you can see here and the stomatal pore opens. At night, the roots absorb less water, thus the guard cells lose their turgidity and shrink as a result of which the stomatal pore closes. I hope you all have understood my explanation of stomata. Thank you. The opening and closing of stomatal pore can be explained by the malleate potassium ion pump theory postulated by Levitt in 1974. According to this hypothesis, the changes in turgor pressure that open and close the stomata result from the reversible intake and loss of capless ions. When a leaf is exposed to light, starch stored in the guard cells are converted to malic acid. The malic acid further dissociates into malic ions and H plus ions. The H plus ions are transported to the epidermal cells and K plus ions enter the guard cells by active transport. Increased percentage of K plus ions and malic ions in the guard cells increase the osmotic pressure. This results in water to enter the guard cells from the surrounding cells by endosmosis. This makes the guard cells turgid and the stomatal pore opens. In dark, photosynthesis stops, but respiration continues. This results in increased carbon dioxide concentration in the substomatal cavities. Due to this, the active transport of K plus ions into the guard cells ceases. Formation of abscessic acid promotes the reversal of H plus and K plus pump. These changes induce the reversal of ion movements and K plus ions from the guard cells move out into the surrounding cells. This decreases the osmotic pressure, thus causing water to move out from the guard cells into the surrounding cells. Therefore, the guard cells become flaccid and stomatal pore closes. Transpiration is the process of water movement through a plant and its evaporation from aerial parts such as leaves, stems and flowers. It takes place mainly through the stomata of leaves. The materials required for performing the potted plant experiment are the potted plant, a polythene bag and a clip. I took a potted plant. Now I am taking the polythene bag to cover only the aerial part of the potted plant and I am sealing it with the clip. Now I am keeping it in the sunlight for about 20 minutes. I have come here after 20 minutes to see that drops of water have appeared on the inner side of the polythene bag. Because drops of water appeared only on the inner side of the polythene bag which is covering the aerial parts of the plant, so it can be concluded that these drops of water appeared due to the process of transpiration from the aerial parts of the plant. The water absorbed by the plants through the roots is lost maximally through the process of transpiration. Also note that experimental factors such as light, wind, temperature, humidity and soil water alter the rate of transpiration. Thank you. Types of transpiration. What is transpiration? Transpiration is the process by which plants lose water stored in them in the form of water vapour into the atmosphere. Plants transpire through leaves, stems, flowers, etc. Depending upon the organ that performs transpiration, transpiration is of three types. Stomatal transpiration. Stomatal transpiration is the evaporation of water through stomata, specialized minor pores present on leaves. It accounts for maximum percentage of water loss around 85 to 90 percent. Cuticular transpiration. 
cuticular transpiration is the evaporation of water through cuticles, an impermeable covering present on leaves and stems. It accounts for about 5-10% to 10 of the total transpiration in plants. However, it is lesser in xerophytes, plants adapted for life in dry habitats since they have thicker cuticles. Lenticular transpiration Lenticular transpiration is the evaporation of water through lenticels, tiny openings present on hard woody barks. It accounts for about 1-5% to of the total transpiration in plants. Thank you. Hello everybody. I am Shriyan Chakravarti of Class 8B and today I am going to show you how a scent of sap works in plants. So before going to the activity, let us first see what exactly is a scent of sap. So the upward movement of water and minerals from the roots to the upper parts of the plant against the gravitational force is called the ascent of sap. Now I will explain you ascent of sap with the help of this chart. The ascent of sap in plants occur mainly through the xylem tissue. The root hair cells in plants absorb mineral salts by active transport. These minerals then reach the root cortex. The root hair cells even absorb water from the soil through the process of osmosis. As the mineral salts get collected in the xylem, the water concentration gets reduced in it, as a result of which a concentration gradient is created that is strong enough to pull up water and minerals towards the stem. The pressure developed in the roots due to the continuous inflow of water that helps in pushing the plant sap upwards is called the root pressure. After this, water moves through the xylem up the stem, then to the leaves. This incident happens due to a pull called transpirational pull. The water and minerals absorbed by the roots are moved upwards through xylem to other plant parts such as stems, leaves and flowers. This upward movement of cell sap which contains water and minerals is called the ascent of sap. So this is how ascent of sap occurs in plants. So now let us go to the activity. For this activity I have a glass full of red colored water and the plant which is which has white colored flowers. So now I will insert this uh, plant into the glass and now I will wait for two to four days. After two to three days we observe that the leaves and flowers show tinges of red. Now we will cut transverse sections of its stem and study it under the microscope. We will observe that the xylem Tissues through which a scent of sap occurs turn red. So I had cut transverse sections of my stem and this is how it looks under the microscope. We can pretty well understand that the xylem tissues through which a scent of sap occurs have turned red. Thank you. We all know that transpiration is one of the most important physiological processes that takes place in a plant's body. However, scientists have also classified transpiration as an evil, a bad thing for plants themselves. So, here we have certain advantages and disadvantages of transpiration listed out, such that we can justify that transpiration is a necessary evil. Let us take a look at the advantages of transpiration. Transpiration is a type of evaporation. It helps control the plant's body temperature just like sweating does to ours. Since it is a type of evaporation, it produces a cooling effect in the plant. Transpiration helps distribute the water among the various parts of the plant via the stem and the roots. It helps in gaseous exchange in plants. However, this happens only during the daytime. Transpiration facilitates a very important physiological process known as ascent of sap. We will now take a look at the disadvantages of transpiration. Excessive transpiration leads to a stage when the amount of water lost becomes more than the amount of water absorbed. This leads to drooping of leaves, young stems and flowers 
This condition is known as wilting. Excessive transpiration leads to the loss of water content in the plant body. Less water hinders the growth and development of the plant and hence the plant becomes stunted. A single bout of wilting can reduce 50% of the plant's growth. This happens due to decreased availability of water in the plant's body. It checks the meristematic activity and hence the formation of fruits, flowers and seeds is highly affected. Excessive transpiration results in the formation of a plant hormone called abscisic acid which when produced in excess prevents many plant processes and promotes abscission which is premature natural shedding of leaves, fruits and flowers. We can all see that transpiration has its weights on both the ends of the balance. Therefore, it is quite justified to say that transpiration is a necessary evil. Greetings everyone. Here we have the setup of an osmoscope. Osmoscope is a device which performs osmosis and osmosis is the process by which molecules of a solvent pass through a semi-permeable membrane from a region of lower concentration to a region of its higher concentration. As you can see here, we have used a potato to make the osmoscope. The potato has been peeled and hollowed from inside and sugar water is kept inside. A pin marks the level of sugar water. Outside the potato in the bowl, I have taken water which has been colored red and with the marker, I have shown the level of colored water. Now that we have let the osmoscope rest for a couple of hours, we can see that the potato has performed osmosis. There is an increase in the level of sugar solution. The increase has been marked by a different pin. Hence, there is also a decrease in the level of water outside the potato, which has been shown with the marker. During the process of osmosis, the water in the bowl, which has lower concentration, travels through the potato, which acts as the semi-permeable membrane, to the sugar solution, which has higher concentration. Therefore, there is a significant rise in the sugar solution and a significant decrease in the level of water. Greetings everyone. Today, I'll be speaking on the significance of osmosis in plants. Osmosis is a physical phenomenon where diffusion takes place when two liquids of different concentration are separated by a semi-permeable membrane and it continues till the two liquids attain same concentration. Absorption of water in plants takes place through root hairs which reach the capillary water of the soil particles. The cellulose cell wall is the permeable membrane between the external weak capillary water and the internal concentrated cell sap of the vacuoles. The cell membrane is semi-permeable and thus osmosis occurs. As a result of osmosis, the turgor pressure tends to force water out of the cell into the adjacent cortical cell and so on leading to cell-to-cell -cell osmosis. Opening and closing of stomata in plants rely on osmosis too. When the guard cells swell up with water, the stomatal pore opens and it closes when the guard cells lose water. Thus we can see how osmosis proves to be one of the most important processes in the plant. Thank you. Hello everyone. Now we are about to see yet another application of osmosis which is the germination of a seed. So let's take a look at the activity. Few gram seeds were taken and had been soaked in water. After 8 to 10 hours, swelling was observed in the gram seeds. And after 2 days, the result is as displayed. The gram seeds had germinated. Now let us try to understand what actually happens in the process. During the beginning stage of germination, the seeds take up water rapidly from the soil and this results in the swelling and softening of the seed coat at an optimum temperature. This stage is referred to as imbibition. Imbibition is defined as a phenomenon of adsorption of water or any other liquid by the solid particles of a substance without forming a solution. 
In this case, water is being absorbed by the seed. It starts the growth process by activation of enzymes. The seed activates its internal physiology and starts to respire and produce proteins and metabolizes the stored food. This is a lab phase of seed germination. The seeds when absorbing water swell up due to imbibition and endosmosis. During these two processes, water enters the cell. Due to endosmosis, at a point, the seed coat is unable to bear the turgor pressure and hence the seed coat bursts. By rupturing of the seed coat, the radical emerges to form the primary root. The seed starts absorbing underground water. After the emergence of the radical and the primule, the shoots start growing upwards. In the final stage of seed germination, the seeds become metabolically active, elongate and divide to give rise to the seedling. We should also remember that turgidity is necessary for plant cells to make them remain position standing. The water pressure inside plant cells is called turgor pressure and it is maintained by a process called osmosis. In germination, due to turgidity, the embryo gets more rigid and comes out of the seed coat dimming germination. It helps in the movement of nutrient solution from cell to cell and is also essential for the escalation of a dissimilar organ. Thank you. A potometer is an instrument used to measure the rate of water uptake by a plant during transpiration. Potometers are of two types, an air bubble potometer and a weight or a mass potometer. This is the simplified model of a potometer. The funnel has been fitted to pour water into the experimental setup. Following that is a rubber tube which acts as a capillary tube. The tube has been filled with colored water. A plant shoot has been fitted to the other end of the tube. The entire setup has been made airtight using Vaseline and tapes. This is what the setup looks like after being kept in sunlight for 3 hours. This is the initial water level. This is the final water level. The reduction in water level is proof of transpiration. This decrease in water level can be measured and by putting it in the formula volume is equals to pi r square h, we can measure the volume of water reduced. And by dividing that volume by the time taken, we can calculate the approximate rate of transpiration of this plant. Bubbles is that calcium carbonate which is CaCl. 
CO3 dissolves in the acetic acid which is CH3COOH. As a result, carbon dioxide gas is released which forms the bubbles. So that is from day 1 I have noted down my observation which is deep dieting vinegar egg immersed completely. I have some tips for you all. Vinegar has a bad smell so I will suggest you to keep it in such a place that the smell does not reach to you. So that is from day 1 I will keep this egg untouched for the remaining day and tomorrow I will see what changes has been observed. Today is the second day of our rubber egg experiment. Now let's see what changes are observed in the egg. As I can see no changes are observed in the egg. Many bubbles have formed on the surface of the vinegar. So now I will change the vinegar. As you can see I have changed the vinegar and again bubbles are forming on the egg. Now let's see what the egg behaves like in the third day. Today is the third day of our rubber egg experiment. Now let's see what change has been observed in the egg. Also coming out, I have recorded my observation here also. On day two, I noted down no changes observed, and I, day three, I noted down eggshell cracked and coming off. So that brings us to the end of the third day. I hope that tomorrow will be the last day, and let's see what happens tomorrow. from the glass to a plate and now I will rub the eggshell off under running water. As you can see I am rubbing the shell off and, the, and in my hand the calcium carbonate is coming off. Now I will completely rub the shell off. Now I have completely rubbed the eggshell off and this is the final egg. As you can see, this is the inner membrane and is a translucent object. Inside this is the egg white and the egg yolk. Now let me show you the chemical reaction that occurs. 2CH3COOH which is acetic acid plus calcium carbonate makes up calcium acetate plus water plus carbon dioxide. So I get calcium carbonate plus acetic acid which leaves me, uh, which the bubbles form that leaves behind inner membrane yolk and egg white which results into calcium acetate, water and the carbon dioxide which is the bubbles. When calcium carbonate became used up, it left calcium acetate and carbon dioxide which I note over here. The carbon dioxide allows the egg to become translucent and causes a change in color. As you can see, the egg is translucent. So let me show you now the structure of egg before and after the experiment. The structure of egg is that the egg cell, the inner membrane and the egg white and the yolk and the air cell is present before the experiment. Note that the egg cell is present only. The structure of the egg after experiment which is the inner membrane, the egg white and the egg yolk and the space for the air cell. Now note that the air cell, that the egg shell is not over here. So that means this is the inner membrane. Now let, now let me tell you some fun facts about the egg. If you squeeze it, it will become bouncy and not too much because it can burst. If you prick it, the egg, the egg white, the yolk and the inner membrane will come out and you will see the separately the three things. So that is from our rubber egg experiment. I hope you liked my experiment. Thank you for watching. Dear friends and respected teachers, My name is Oishani Baso and I study in class 7F Garden High School. Today, I am going to show you how to make a natural pH indicator for determining the pH of various household substances. First of all, what does pH stand for? pH is a unit of measurement 
and the abbreviation stands for potential hydrogen. It tells us how acidic or basic are substances depending upon the number of free hydrogen and hydroxyl ions in it. A substance is acidic if it has more free hydrogen ions in it, whereas a substance is basic if it has more free hydroxyl ions in it. The pH range goes from 0 to 14, 7 is neutral. A pH level less than that is acidic, whereas a level more than that is basic or alkaline. pH is important since it reflects the chemical conditions of a solution and even our stomach acids need to be at a certain pH in order to work properly. Now that we know what pH is, let us see how to make the natural pH indicator at home and proceed with the experiment. The materials required are some hibiscus flowers, a glass, hot water, vinegar, distilled water, soap water, tap water, two spoons, two small plates, a dropper, a slide, two test tubes and garden soil. Now let's get to the experiment. First we take our glass and put in three hibiscus flowers in it. Then we add the hot water to the glass and with the help of the spoon we stir it. Then we leave it undisturbed for 5 to 10 minutes. After about 5 minutes, we remove the flask from the solution. The solution obtained out of the hibiscus flask and the hot water will serve as a natural pH indicator. So let's test it out. Here we have a slide labeled as distilled water and two small plates labeled as vinegar and soap solution. Then we take our distilled water and put it onto the glass slide. Then we put the vinegar into the first plate And some soap solution into the other plate. Then with the help of the dropper we put in our pH indicator to each of these liquids and observe what happens to them. As we can see, distilled water remains colorless and shows no change in color, while vinegar turns pink in color and soap solution turns green in color. This shows that distilled water is a neutral substance, vinegar is an acidic substance, whereas soap solution is a basic substance. Now, Let's use our pH indicator to determine the pH of garden soil and tap water. Here we have some tap water in a test tube and to it with the help of the dropper we add the pH indicator. Then we leave it undisturbed for about 10 minutes. After that we take the garden soil and add some water to it in order to make a solution. Since the pH of a substance can only be determined if it is in the liquid state. Then like we did for the tap water, we will take the pH indicator and put it into the test tube. Then we leave it undisturbed for about 10 minutes. As we can see, tap water shows negligible color change which states that it is more or less a neutral substance. On the other hand, garden soil turns green in color which shows that it is a basic substance. 
This happens because hibiscus contains a color pigment which is known as anthocyanin that is a natural chemical indicator. This is a very simple and a useful experiment for determining the pH of commonly used substances in our day-to-day -day life and you can go ahead and try this at home. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. and respected teachers. I am Deopama De of class 7F studying in Garden High School. Today I am going to show you how to make a soap. Soap, as you know, is an integral part of our lives as it helps us to maintain good health and hygiene. It finds its importance in everyday life and is an essential item. This process of making soaps is known as saponification. Saponification is the hydrolysis of an ester with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide to give sodium or potassium salt of the acid, acid and alcohol. During saponification, ester reacts with an inorganic base to produce alcohol and soap. Generally, it occurs when triglycerides, fats present in oils, are reacted with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, also known as a lye, to give glycerol and a fatty acid salt called soap. Let me show you the chemical reaction for saponification. The materials required for this chemical experiment are sodium hydroxide also known as lye. Now you can either use lye as sodium hydroxide for making hard soaps or potassium hydroxide to make soft or liquid soaps. But I am going to use sodium hydroxide in this experiment water, coconut oil. Now I have taken sodium hydroxide, now I have taken 17 grams of sodium hydroxide, 34 grams of water and 100 grams of coconut oil. Now this is a lavender essential oil for the aroma of the soap. This is a coloring agent, lavender coloring agent for the color of the soap. This is the weighing machine where I have met, uh, weighed the chemicals. A big stainless bowl to mix the chemicals as it is an exothermic reaction and this stainless steel bowl can withstand this high temperature because of its higher melting point. A spatula to settle the soap batter in the mold and an immerse blender for the soap batter. Now, now first I am going to put the water in the big stainless bowl to make the lye solution. Carefully we put this sodium hydroxide. Now it's better to wear a pair of gloves as you're performing a chemical reaction and for extra precaution you can use the gloves. Now you have to mix it well so that the lye completely dissolves in water and forms the solution. Now the lye solution is prepared. Now we have to uh, keep it aside for some time as it's an exothermic reaction and needs to cool down. Now we have to gradually put the coconut oil in this solution. Not together but gradually. Now use the immerse blender to blend it. Now the coconut oil is ready for use in the soap. Now you can see that coconut oil is completely dissolved in the bowl. Now you can see that the coconut oil is ready to be used to blend the coconut oil with the rest of the soap. The lye solution is about to boil. The essential oil has already melted in the soap. Now we have to put the soap back in. Now it has been 
blended quite well and you can stop blending it. Now we have to pour it into the mold. To shake it well or just settle it with the spatula and we have to rest it overnight so that the soap solidifies and I'm coming back after 24 hours and I will show you the final result of the soap the soap has solidified and I'm going to take it out of the mold to show you So you see the soap, um, the soap is quite fragrant and the color of the lavender color of the soap is quite evident. Now uh, the soap can finally be used after four to six weeks so that it cures and thank you for watching. Hello everybody, I am Anjish Shadas of Garden High School Class 8E. Methane is the greenhouse gas mainly responsible for climate change, the biggest challenge to our lives right now. It accounts for more than 30% of the global warming throughout the year and is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. But what if we turn this foe into a friend by utilizing it to produce biogas for cooking using a biodigester? Today in my project, I shall show you how. This is a working model of a biogas plant. This is the digester or the fermenter, the gas holder, the inlet pipe with funnel, the effluent pipe, the gas cork and the gas outlet. Now let us come to the schematic diagram. The feedstock is poured through the funnel and inlet pipe into the fermenter or digester. Here. Through anaerobic digestion, biogas is produced. This biogas is stored in the gas holder. The gas holder floats up because the methane in the biogas, being lighter than air, pushes it upwards. When the gas cock is opened, the gas flows out through the gas outlet to the gas stove and is used for cooking. to produce the biogas is made from biodegradable municipal, agricultural or food waste, organic sewage and plant material. This is a sample of the organic wastes which I have pulped and mixed with water to produce this feedstock. Now I'll pour this feedstock through the funnel and inlet pipe into the airtight digester and I will leave this setup undisturbed for at least 24 hours for the biogas to be produced through anaerobic digestion. In the first stage of this sequential enzymatic breakdown, that is hydrolysis, complex organic molecules of carbohydrates, proteins and fats are broken down into soluble organic molecules of sugars, amino acids and fatty acids by hydrolytic bacteria. This is followed by acidogenesis, which converts the remaining components into volatile fatty acids, alcohols, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and various other byproducts. Acidogenesis is the third stage, where the simple molecules are further digested by acetogens to produce mainly acetic acid along with hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Finally comes the fourth and terminal stage. Methanogenesis. Here, high percentages of methane and carbon dioxide along with other gases are produced, which together constitute the biogas. Now, the gas holder is full of biogas. When I open the gas cock, the gas flows through the outlet to the stove.
As the stove is lighted, we can see the flame. The color of the flame is blue because it is produced from methane and it is a non-luminous flame produced by complete combustion of the gas. Hence, it has a lot more energy than a luminous flame and is much hotter. So, it is more effective also. Here are some of the safety precautions that must be followed. Biogas is a clean, green and renewable energy source. Leaders at the COP26 Climate Summit have said that anaerobic digestion is a key technology to reduce methane emissions and fulfill the global methane pledge. It is the way forward to heal the world towards a better tomorrow. Thank you. Hello everyone. Today we are here with our physics model electric bell. An electric bell works on the principle of an electromagnet. So now, so let's see the components of the electric bell we made. So this is the first component, the 9 volt battery which produces the electricity. This is the gong of the electric bell. This is the piece of iron around which wire has been coiled. This is the hammer which strikes the gong to produce the sound. The hammer is attached at the end of the armature and the armature is attached to the metallic springy strip. The metallic springy strip remains at the in the remains in contact with the adjusting screw when electric current is not applied. When electric current is applied, this iron starts acting as a magnet. So now let's learn how this electric bell actually works. Initially when the switch is not pressed, no current flows in the electromagnet. The metallic springy strip remains in contact with the adjusting screw. When the switch is pressed, the current flows through the circuit. Next, the electromagnet is powered and generates a magnetic field that attracts the mature. Due to the movement of the mature, the hammer strikes the gong and the bell rings. When the hammer strikes the gong, then the contact between the contact screw and the metallic strip breaks and thus the circuit becomes incomplete and the current stops in the coil of the electromagnet so it loses its magnetism. The, this process is repeated when the switch is clicked again. Now let's learn about electromagnets from our friend Aditya. We need an electromagnet here. I've done it by winding copper wire around a soft iron core and then connecting it to a battery. As I close the circuit, the iron core will get magnetized and it will attract iron objects. Let's see the experimental setup. So this is the battery, this is the wire and this is the solenoid. Now. I'll close the circuit and we'll see that miraculously the iron slab will get attracted to the magnet. Now let's do it. Working of an electromagnet. Let's consider the iron near itself. Why does it not produce a magnetic field when not influenced by an electric field? Normally, the atoms in the needle are oriented in the random directions and individual magnet fields cancel each other out. Under the influence of an electric current, these atoms are reoriented to start pointing in the same direction. All these individual magnetic fields together create a strong magnetic field. As the current flow increases, this degree of reorientation also increases, resulting in a stronger magnetic field. Once all the particles are reoriented perfectly in the same direction, increasing the current flow will not affect the magnetic field produced. At this point, the magnetic the magnet is said to be saturated. Now, so now, let's see the working of our model. When I apply the electricity to the electromagnet, the bell starts ringing as you can see here. So thank you for watching our video. I am Ankur Ghosh, a student of class 9D Garden High School. I will be presenting an experimental demonstration of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, one of the fundamental ideas in quantum physics. Given by physicist Werner Heisenberg, it states that it's impossible for us to know with certainty both the position as well as the momentum of a particle. Hence, the more certain one of these two quantities is, the more uncertain the other shall be. Mathematically, we write it in the equation, the product of del x and del p is greater than or equals h upon 4 pi, where del x represents the uncertainty in the position of the particle, del p uncertainty in the momentum, and h is Planck's constant having a value of 6.626 times 10 to the power of minus 34 joule seconds.
I'll perform a simple experiment to test this principle. I will be using a laser torch, an adjustable slit through which the laser beam passes, a screen for projection and a dark room. In the experiment, I will pass the laser beam through the slit and obtain a bright spot on the screen. The size of the slit can be altered. I'll make the slit small now. So I'm actually forcing photons to pass through a much, much narrow passage. Hence, the uncertainty in the position of the photon decreases. As per the uncertainty principle, the uncertainty in the momentum rises. So the photons scatter away in random directions because of very uncertain momentum. As a result, the spot I obtained on the screen gets D-shaped. We'll soon see the experiment. So this is my simple homemade setup. This is the screen where the laser light will be projected. This is my green laser. I have this special adjustable slit in my hand. This is made from a piece of thermocol. As you can see, there are two strips of paper on both the sides with which I can slowly close the slit. So I can control the passage of light with it. The light will pass through the slit like this and a spot will be obtained on the screen. Now let me start the experiment for which I'll have to switch off the lights in the room first. So I've started the experiment. I have passed green laser beam through the slit and a bright spot can be seen on the screen. Now I'll slowly close the slit. So I'm decreasing the diameter of the slit. Just one moment please, let me do it. Yes. So I've made the diameter less than one millimeter now. I've measured that before. We can notice some changes in the spot. The shape is changing. It is no more exactly a circle. It seems to spread out from the sides, yes. This is a consequence of the uncertainty principle. So this is indicating that the photons are scattering out here and there because of very uncertain momentum. I am pointing with my red laser the line along which the photons scatter out. Yes, along this line. Also one more thing we might notice that the spot is becoming faint. That's simply because I am closing the slit and so less light is able to reach the screen. So the spot is losing out its intensity. It's very difficult to see it now. It's slowly faded away. Thus we test the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Today, we the students of class 8E shall walk you through the demonstration of the mechanism and the working principle of the hydroelectric power plant. This is a working model of a hydroelectric power plant. It works on the principle of conversion of kinetic energy possessed by flowing water, that is hydroenergy, into electrical energy. The components of the plant are dam, control gate, penstock, nozzle, impulse turbine connected to the armature of a generator through a shaft coupled with both, a tailwaste and a bulb. To prevent wastage, the water used for demonstration is being collected to water a plant. This is the diagram of a hydroelectric power plant. This is the dam in which water is stored at a high altitude. When the control gates are opened, the water flows down through the penstock and nozzle onto the blades of the impulse turbine and makes them rotate. The turbine is connected to a shaft coupled with the armature of the generator. As the turbine rotates, the armature is also rotated. As a result, electricity is produced. The generated electricity is then transmitted through high voltage transmission lines to different substations. Now we'll focus on the working of our model. As the control kit is opened, Water from the dam is falling through the penstock under high pressure onto the blades of the impulse turbine. Therefore, the potential energy of the stored water is getting converted to kinetic energy which is rotating the blades of the turbine. And in turn, the 
armature of the generator to produce electricity. As a result, the bulb lights up. Now you may ask, why hydroelectricity? Its usage reduces environmental pollution to almost zero as hydroelectricity is a clean, green, renewable form of energy. Hydroelectric power plants can be installed on every suitable dam for generation of hydroelectricity. It is very cost effective as it requires least usage of machinery and complex technique and yet it is highly efficient. I am Suhana Rao. Today I am going to present an experiment called the curtain razor. This experiment is done by Samita Paul and Suhana Rao. The main parts of the model are the universal DC motor, the dual switch and the battery. This is an universal DC motor which can rotate in both directions by reversing the direction of flow of the charge. The red wire represents the positive terminal middle and the black wire represents the negative terminal. This is connected to the battery as the connection of wires play an important role in which way the curtain will move. This is a dual switch. It has two switches and they are connected to the terminals of the motor and are used to make and break the circuit. This is an arsenal battery which has a voltage of 9 V. You can change the volt of the battery according to your preference but the amount of volt in the battery will affect the speed at which the curtain is rolled up or down. This is a diagram of the curtain razor. These are the motors, this is the switch and this is the battery and here is the curtain. To make the curtain razor, the first step is to, is to put the two metal stamps on the plank. Connect the rod with a connect supporter and the motor. Attach the dual switch with the battery. Connect the dual switch with the wires of the motor. Thank you. Hi, I am Samita Paul of 6B. Here is the electric curtain laser. This is a dual switch. The dual switch functions only when both the switches are either in on or off position. When both the switches are in on position, the current flows from the battery to the universal motor, causing it to rotate in clockwise direction, thereby rolling up the curtain. When both the switches are in off position, the polarities of the motor changes and it rotates in anti-clockwise direction, thereby unrolling the curtain. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Divyanka Chan from Class 6B and today I'm going to tell you how does this DIY hand sanitizer work. For that I have a diagram on the of the front side. Of the front side there is a syringe which you can pop it out if you want to refill your bottle with sanitizer. Here is the straw which when you push the button it will dispense some sanitizer on your palms. Now let's see how does this whole thing works. For that we have to see the back side. On the back side, you can see I have colored some parts of uh, different different colors. This part, which is blue in color, all the blue in color parts indicate cardboard. The yellow parts indicate alluvial voice. The pink parts indicate wires. This is the small battery, which is of 9 volt. Uh, and this is connected with these wires uh, using a battery connector. This green part is the empty bottle, this one. Uh, inside it, one, two of the wires are connected to the aluminium foils, 
and one of them is connected with the submersible pump. The submersible pump, whenever these two comes in contact, automatically starts working. When it starts working, it pumps some sanitizer which goes all the way up through this uh, tube and then this tube is connected with another straw which dispenses sanitizer on your pumps. Now this thread like thing has some work. When you push this button, this thread pulls the rubber band which eventually opens the path of the straw because it is blocked by a piece of cardboard. So this is how this whole thing works and the sanitizer uh, comes and it dispenses on your hand. And Hello everyone, I am Swarnava Dash of Class 6B. Today, I am going to show you the demonstration of a sanitizer dispenser. As you know, the sanitizer is the most crucial thing in our life in this COVID situation. It is as crucial as water. Without water, we can't live. So that's the same for sanitizer. So today, I have thought of making a sanitizer dispenser. And now, I'm going to show you how the sanitizer dispenser works. So you see here, it's very easy to use it. You just have to press this button. And the sanitizer falls immediately after I press the button. Then you have to just rub your hands. Before the video ends, I am going to show you all the sides of my sanitizer dispenser. This is the front side, as you can see. This is the back side. This is the front, upper side. And this is the side view. Thank you for watching. This is the adapter, the wire, the plastic container, the tin can, the connector, the PVC pipes, the motor, the electric wire and the switch. This is the sugar and this is the water. Here we are melting the sugar. We have added water as well so that the sugar does not turn into brown sugar residue. We also have to make sure that none of the sugar crystals are left unmelted. Adding the food coloring is optional. Here we are pouring the sugar syrup into the empty tin can. Here is the finished cotton candy and it looks delicious. The increasing use of electronic appliances is leading to the increased cases of fire nowadays. Small fires in house can lead to big accidents. Thus, homemade fire alarms are very important for emergency situations. Homemade fire alarms are very easy to make and every house can have one. We have made a homemade fire alarm which is very easy to make and has components which are easily available at the market. It is also a very low cost project. Components used in this project a tube light starter, a DC water pump, plywood, copper wire, 9 volt battery, a candle to represent a house fire, a water container and a bottle cap. One of the wires of the tube light starter is connected with the pump and the second wire is connected with the positive terminal of the battery. The positive terminal of the pump is connected with the negative terminal of the battery. The circuit diagram is shown below. Hello everybody, this is a fire extinguisher with a tube light starter. Here we have used a tube light starter, a candle which is used to represent a house fire and we have a pump which is in a container which contains water. So I will demonstrate a house fire and use the candle 
to heat the tubular starter which will lead to the heating of the bi metallic strip as you can see when the tubular starter is heated the bi metallic strip bends and thus the water pump starts and cools down the tubular starter here we want to represent a house fire and thus we want to show how we can make a simple fire alarm with a tube light starter a tube light starter contains a bimetallic strip which after reaching a high temperature it it uh, bends thus closing the circuit so here after we heat the tube light starter the bimetallic strip bends and closes the circuit and thus the water pump starts the cold water cools the tube light starter and thus the water pump stops प्लान Today we we are going to to do an experiment about how to water plants without one's presence. Now Toshani will tell us how to do the experiment. Watering plants method. The tap water would be open, and at least three to four droplets, or more than that, will fall on the half-long pipe. In one end of the pipe, there would be a stone. The pipe would be balanced on some buckets, which would be kept under the pipe for balancing. Before the other end, where the stone would be kept, there would be one closing point of the half-long pipe. After ten or twelve hours, the water which would fall from the tap would get collected in the half-long pipe. When the half-long pipe will be filled, the tap pipe would be tilted, and the water will go straight into the bowl due to the gravity. A small bowl will be kept at the end of the pipe, as shown in the diagram. There will be four holes in the small bowl, three holes in the opposite side, and one hole where the half-long pipe will be tilted. There would be four pipes connected to the bowl. The pipes would lead the pots consisting the plants. When the pipe will reach the small bowl, the water will automatically reach the pot through the four half pipes. When the water will reach the pots, the half-long pipe will should be tilted to its original position because of the weight kept on the other side. This would repeat as a result the plants would be watered every day time to time and now shobhi will do the experiment and now i am going to show the procedure see the water is almost filled after 12 to 13 hours it is almost filled and now we see the, how the water goes and now the water is filled and now we see do the water go now we see that the water has gone to its respective pots This is our model fresh hail which is in smoke absorber and an air purifier there is an inlet an activated charcoal chamber and an outlet we have installed one fan and one motor just inside the inlet and on the other side one fan and one motor just inside the outlet these two fans and motors can be operated by these two batteries and these two switches which are present on the outside wall there is an activated charcoal chamber inside we have applied vaseline gel on the inside wall of the inlet and a three red mask is attached to the outlet there is a detachable transparent cover on top through which the activated charcoal can be refilled when needed 
when not in use both the inlet and the outlet has to be tightly capped to prevent entry of air into the system because it may lead to deactivation of the activated charcoal when not in use for a long time now i'm going to show how this model works when in use both the inlet and the outlet should be open and the switches should be on i have lit some incense sticks which releases smoke as you can see smoke is going in through the inlet but it is not coming out through the outlet it is a three level purification system the inlet fan sucks in the air when the smoky air enters the system the particulate matter gets present in the air gets stuck to the greased wall of the inlet when air passes through the activated charcoal chamber the odor toxic gases and volatile organic compounds pet dander get trapped by the pores of the activated charcoal by the process of adsorption when purified air passes through the outlet the germs get filtered through the three layer mask so ultimately purified air comes out through the outlet thank you Pause. So, as you could see in the previous video, this car was avoiding all the obstacles it was coming across and finding its way out. Well, let me introduce you to the obstacle avoidance car. This car is supposed to avoid all the obstacles it comes across and steer its way out. Now, if we talk about the components that helps this car work, then starting off with the battery, which is connected to the breadboard. Then we have the uh, DCBO motors with the wheels. we have the breadboard with arduino and the motor driver then we have the wires we have the ir sensors and we have the motor uh, caster wheel which is all on all of these components are mounted on a chassis as for how this car works is that the power from the battery flows into the breadboard where everything is internally connected then the sensors are connected to the uh, battery so the power from the battery is going to flow to the sensor and it will help the sensor work then uh, this ir sensor consists of a transmitter and a receiver if there is an object close if there is an uh, object close enough for the light that is transmitted by the transmitter to bounce back and re be received by the receiver the sensor will give an output this output will go into the input pins of the arduino nano then depending on how you have programmed the arduino nano the arduino nano can manipulate the current and the output then it is uh, the arduino is connected to the motor driver this motor driver helps in driving the motor because the direct output from the arduino is not powerful enough to drive the motors then uh, if we take a demonstration because uh, the and the sensors are also diagonally connected with the motors so if there is an object say on the left sensor the sensors the light given out by the led is going to bounce back up from the object and be received by the receiver the, and uh, that is the reason why the right wheel is stopping because uh, uh, right wheel is stopping and the left wheel is going to move so it will go to the right side and vice versa as far as there is an object on as far as there is an object in front of both the sensors then uh, the sensors are going, uh, then the motors are going to run in the opposite direction and take go backwards and take a turn so as for how we could use this technology in real life is we could use this in uh, autonomous cars that are going to be in for future technology or we could use this in warehouses thank you good morning everyone my name is mohana ghosh i'm from class 6f science is in my blood wherever i go i try to connect my surroundings with science being so fascinated about the magic of physics i decided to work out on an experiment which is based on the concepts of physics static equilibrium for this experiment we will require an egg a 
and some sugar crystals. First, we will try to balance the egg on the table. Each time you will notice that the egg is toppling down. Now, we will take some sugar particles and then try to balance the egg on the sugar particles. We can see that the egg is standing steady on the sugar particles. Now, even if we blow on the egg, we will see that the egg is still standing steady. It is standing on only two or few sugar particles. This happens because now the static equilibrium is maintained. This is a very simple and nice experiment to explain the concept of static equilibrium. You can try this at your home and understand the concept of static equilibrium. Thank you.